Hello and welcome. Thank you for being with us today. If you are new with us today, welcome. You're more than happy to have you here. Um, if you are new, please check out our website at www.intlword.net. There you can find links to get to know us as the hospitality team a little bit better. Um, and feel free to send us any of your prayer requests um, or any other healthy feedback you may have. Um, make sure to also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can re-listen to our past lessons. The lesson from today will be on there as well um, um, throughout the week. Um, you will also get our monthly newsletters if you do sign up through our website. Please, just a reminder to keep all devices on mute, just to avoid any background noises. If you are to be asked a question, just mute, unmute yourself and then remute once answered. Pastor Scott has a great lesson for us today entitled, Get a Handle on Anger and Frustration. Um, we will start off today by having Elder um, Brian Barrett lead us in prayer and then followed by Elder Angel Barrett will be leading us um, in our song selection today. Um, Sister Jessica will be doing our praise reports and Minister Emmanuel will read today's intro to today's lesson. So without further ado, um, let's open our hearts and minds as we're led into prayer. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice in it as we celebrate the victory that you have given us in Jesus Christ. We just thank God for our pastor today and the lesson and the wonderful people who have joined in to hear what thus said the Lord through the scriptures. Yes. We ask that you bless each and every one. Give us an understanding and give us an ear to hear and a mind and a heart to receive what the word has for us today through this lesson. We ask, Lord God, that you bless each and every one. We pray for a special blessing for the pastor to bring forth the word of God in a way that we can clearly understand and know what you want from us and desire from your people in the name of Jesus Christ. So we just thank you, give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank God for our opportunity to give him glory. Praise the Lord. I'm excited about the um, testimonies that are going to be given today. And all of the glory goes to God. Praise the Lord. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. He is the King of kings. And let's lift our voices loud in praises to Jesus, the Son of God. Oh, glory and honor are his. We lift up our voices to him. And the song that we sing is a song of praise to the name of Jesus the Son of God. Oh, I give him glory. Lord, I give you honor. You deserve it all. You are the King of kings. And I lift my voice. Jesus, the Son of God, I worship you forever, Lord Jesus, the Son of the living God, he deserves all the glory, Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. 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 Amen.
Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Jesus. Amazing. So we have a lot of testimonies that came in this week. Praise the Lord that he is moving mightily. Um, first and foremost, let's start off with Pastor Scott. Um, he was in North Carolina last weekend and unfortunately lost his car keys. And um, he was to get them replaced was going to cost him a good chunk of money, $1,000 just to get them replaced. But one of his um, friends uh, went back to where he left his car that night and there was an abandoned building. He ended up finding the keys um, by a window. So, I mean, praise the Lord, because those keys were brought back to Pastor Scott and nobody stole his car. <laughs> you know, that's like the main thing. It's like anybody finds keys, let's just you know, hit the trigger, the little alarm to see where his car is. And, you know, you never know. Like people, yeah, but just praise God that it, he turned it all around um, and he has his keys back. And then um, with Sister Tanya this week, the Lord has been giving her strength and peace, you know, from endurances that she's been dealing with, you know, family members that she's been running into, you know, he's just working in her and just, you know, given her that peace that she needs to um, surpass all those things that we don't understand, but God understands. Amen. And um, Minister Dion and Sister Shade have been blessed financially, you know, blessings are just coming in. And, you know, he put in parentheses, big time. So, you know, we know those blessings, the window of heaven just open over their household. And, you know, all these blessings are just coming in. And then on my end, my mom got sick on Friday, and she was admitted in the hospital. And me and Fernando went and prayed over her Friday night and um, the Lord just touched her. You know, she, she just opened her eyes wide and said, I feel God, he's here. He's working through my body. I just feel hot, you know? And when you see those, her face and just the way her eyes were open, she just, you can tell yesterday we talked to her and I mean, even her voice was different and, you know, she's just doing amazing and we just give God the, you know, the glory because as well, yesterday he gave me a song, the battle is his. So he wanted me to stand firm that he had this and that to leave my fears at his feet and he was going to take care of it. So I just give, you know, God, all the glory for what he's doing through each and every person, you know, and blessing everybody. So amen. Praise amen. God. Amen. Amen. Praise amen. God. Praise God. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Jessica, for the wonderful praise reports. Brother Brian Bear for the uh, magnificent prayer. And um, also Shade for the lovely welcome. I'm here to read today's message into the lesson. And give me a quick moment, hop off screen. It reads, ever felt drained by everything around you, wanting to escape from the humdrum of life? To add insult to injury, it appears that others are so happy and prospering effortlessly. It's as if every time you try to do what's right, you find yourself angered and frustrated, not seeing any positive results. If this is you, be sure to join us as we discover how to get a handle on our anger and frustrations. Over to you, Pastor Scott. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, listen, I am so uh, happy and aesthetic over all of these testimonies. I mean, anything that God is doing, I want to be a part of. And I'm sure you think that same way. Anything that God is doing, because whatever God is doing, it's always going to be for the betterment of us. And so when I hear these testimonies about blessings and financial blessings and God moving and bringing things back in our life that we lost, you know, oh, I love that. And then you hear Sister Jessica uh, talking about the prayer that was made for her mother and, and how God touched her mother and raised her. Come on now. Listen, I want you to know God is not obligated to have to do anything for us. He's not. But he's so good and he's so kind and he's so loving. He wants to do that for us. And you know what? I was having a conversation just yesterday uh, with Sister Shalita. 
And in the conversation we were, we were discussing about the goodness of God, and I want you to know, when God moves for his people, it should touch our heart that we want to do what he wants us to do, not out of obligation, but out of appreciation for him. See, obligation means I've got to do it. I have no choice, regardless if I want to or not, I've got to. Don't you know, it's like having a relationship. If you and those of you who are in a relationship are in a relationship, you should be doing for each other because you want to do it for each other. You shouldn't have to have each other being told, do this or do that, or you got to do this, you got to do that. No, but when you love someone, I'll say it like that. When you love someone, you want to automatically do what makes them happy. It's not about you as an individual. It's about what that one that you love wants, and you should want to do what it takes to make them happy, because that's how God is. Say amen. So today's lesson uh, is entitled, Get a Handle on Anger, on Your Anger and Frustrations. Get a Handle on Your Anger and Frustrations. What I'd like to do, I would like to set a standard and tell you a little bit of this story and this testimony, because it all ties in. I want you to know this, and I'm going to say this, and I want you all to know, as I always say, God is speaking to you today. He has a specific word just for you. And it is of no co uh, coincidence that you're here because God wants to meet you and me right where we are. There is nothing that just comes in our life out of happenstance. It just happened. No, I want you to know God is so intricate that everything that's in our life, he's observing and certain things he's sending also himself. God will always test us. The devil will always tempt us. Well, how do you differentiate? What's the difference between a test and a temptation? This is good to know. When God is testing us, he will never test us with sin, nor can he be tempted with sin. He will never test us with sin. When you go to a classroom, how the teacher knows that you're ready to be promoted to the next level or to the next grade is that they will test you. Now, temptation comes from the devil and the devil will tempt you with sin. He will tempt you with ungodliness. You never have to ask yourself, is God tempting me to fornicate? God wouldn't do that. Is God tempting me to lie? God wouldn't do that. Is God tempted me to steal and to kill and to cheat and to do all these ungodly things? No. So anything that is ungodly that seemingly coming to you as a temptation is of the devil. And us yielding to it is us yielding to the fleshly side of us, which is carnal, which enjoys the simple life of ungodliness. That's the difference. So today I'm going to talk about a really unique situation, and it kind of falls in line of what I had to deal with last week. So let me give you a little bit of intricate parts that I didn't share about my lost keys last week. So here I was out of town. I was in Carolina, North Carolina, because I was asked to perform a wedding there. And because I'm licensed, I perform weddings for people also as a pastor and as an elder, I perform weddings. So I came there to do a wedding. Well, just before the wedding began, I remember that I had to get to that wedding early because I did not want things to pop up on me. If you're a person and you have a godly business mind, you should always want to attend whatever you're involved with early so that who knows, God might want to use you. Well, when I got there, I found out that I did not, you know, there was nobody there to set the room up, but the bride, the people that were going to set their room up for the decorations weren't there or anything. And I was like, oh my God, and I'm dressed and got my suit on and everything. And then I found myself doing lifting boxes and setting up plates and all these things. Listen, when you are a body, when you are a part of a body, and when you love people, you do what it 
takes in order to be a blessing to people. You just don't bail out on people and say, well, it ain't my responsibility. No, when you are a person in God, you want anything for God to work. And this is a marriage. And Bible says that marriage is honorable in the sight of God. So I wanted that marriage to work. And I didn't go in there because I'm the pastor and all I can do is preach. You know what? I got two hands. Thank you, Jesus. Got 10 fingers. And then fingers in these two hands, can lift things, pick up things, set up plates, and I wasn't above doing that. The greatest, Jesus said, the greatest of you is the one who's the greatest servant. If you can't serve people, you don't please God. I had to let that sink in. If you don't serve people, you can't please God. Well, I, you know, those people aren't people I like. Well, then take the Bible for what it says. The Bible says, do good to them that do evil against you and say all manner of evil against you. So if you can't do that, you still can't please God because God says it doesn't matter if you don't get along with people. Don't you know doing good is in representation of the God you serve and the God I serve. So I'm setting up all these boxes and I'm putting these silverware, fork, spoon, knife, putting down napkins and everything, and they're going from place to place and everything. And then everything's set up. We're getting ready to start the wedding in about 10 minutes. And I say to a friend of mine that I had hold my keys, hey, let me go get my keys so that I don't, I don't mess around and forget that I gave them to you. And they reach in there, you know, they're trying to get the actual keys and then realize, I don't know where the keys are. And I'm thinking, Oh, wait a second. No, not the keys to my new car. Listen, when God blesses you with something and it's a worth, it's up to us to take care of what God's given you. I'm just being real. And I could not find out what I did with, with, with the keys or but give it to them. And they couldn't remember what they did with the keys. So here we go on a new excavation to try to find my keys. And might I just say, we weren't in the um, we weren't in the ritzy part of North Carolina. It was a, as they say, rural area. I don't know. Have any of you all been around rural areas before? Yeah, uh, what you see. What is that fragrance? Mm, that's not flowers. Mm, that's not potpourri. Mm, that's not a good restaurant. That smell like marijuana. <laughs> it smell like drugs. I don't know. Maybe y'all haven't been around the rest of the world, but I'm like, good golly, it's got drugs. It's got people walking around, people looking like crackheads and things like that. And I'm sitting there with my car. And I'm thinking, my God, what am I going to do? And I'm like, Lord, help us, help us find it. So then call the locksmith. Lock, locksmith says, well, you're going to pay $185 just to get in the car. And I'm thinking, because the person that had my keys thought that they locked it in my car. So I said, well, $185, I got to do this wedding. All right, well, well come on, let's just get those keys. Let's pay that $185. Paid the 185, get ready to pay the guy the $185 after he opens the door. He winds up taking about a half an hour. Thank God the wedding was running late. Sometimes it's a good thing things are running late. Don't think that just because things don't start on time is not to your benefit. So I'm sitting there and they finally get the car open. And when the car gets open, the keys are not there. Looking all over the place. Oh my God, what? I know what it is. The keys must be in the trunk because they thought, well, maybe I left it in the trunk. So I go and push the button for the trunk release, but I didn't realize that on the newer cars, they have an actual device that actually disconnects all electronics because they know if it set off the alarm, someone's trying to break in your trunk too. So why not disconnect the actual trunk? So it can't get in the trunk. What do I do? I have to call another locksmith to get in the truck. So we called a locksmith and we called another locksmith and it takes them almost an hour to get in the trunk, but they're charging $332. Jesus. Now, I don't know about you all. I know a couple little things about uh, mathematics and we're over $520 <laughs> just to get in 
the car. They break open into the actual trunk and have to get all these things. And they look all in the trunk and the keys are not there. And I'm saying, oh my God, what in the world? Now, all of this is in the lesson. So I want you to know, I'm not just telling you a story. So if you think that this is just me talking about something, I'm actually dealing with something you're about to deal with. And some of you all that are dealing with. So just listen real closely and don't think and just take in what's being said. So I went and I said, oh my God, what am I gonna do now? The keys aren't here. We're looking, we're all around the place. And then a friend of mine, his name is Minister Rick Mitchell. And he comes walking up to me. He's all calm and cool collective. You know why he's all calm and cool collective? Cause it's not his car, it's mine. He doesn't have to pay $500 to break into your own car that doesn't have the keys that you were looking for. So I'm sitting there like, oh my God. And he says this to me. He says, hey, you know what, uh, Elder? Um, I know we don't know where the keys are, but you know, uh, God does. And I'm thinking, praise God. I'm glad to hear that you know that I know God does because my thing is, even though I know God knows where the keys are, I would like him to tell me so I can get them because I don't know. And as far as I'm concerned, like Sister Jessica said earlier, hey, there are people who don't have good motives. They find the keys. I got a $45,000 car. I got the keys right here. They're going to leave the area. Boop, boop. I'm going to pop that key on there, Put get near the car, turn the car on, zoom. And you should know the enemy's telling me everything. Don't ever think just because you have a title or you've been in God a while that the devil doesn't try to tempt you also. Don't think that. Oh, no. The devil told me, oh, they just waiting for you to get around that corner. As soon as you get ready to do that wedding, they're going to come and take your car. They're going to be driving. They're probably going to drive to Atlanta and just enjoy themselves with your car. And then you'll be sitting around there trying to say, oh, praise the Lord for your wedding. I don't have a car. That's how the devil talks. So I'm sitting there like, Lord, you already know God worked this situation out. It's time to do the wedding. Okay, I go to do the wedding because I got to have somebody there. So I leave my friend there so I can go up and do this wedding real quick and see, you know, and try to keep my mind on the wedding without being disturbed by my car. So I get in there to do the wedding. <laughs> I get in there to do the wedding and I find out that, uh, the bride gets stuck on the stairs, coming up the stairs, because she steps on her dress and can't move, and is about to fall downstairs. And her husband and her, or her husband to be, and her father trying to hold her up and had to practically carry her up these stairs. And I'm like, oh my god! So then I find out half of the wedding party doesn't show up. What in the world is going on? All of these people pay for all these extra meals and dinners, and they cost a lot of money. <clears throat> Half the wedding party doesn't show up. Why? Because they say, we're Muslim. We don't have association or affiliation with Christians. So we're not going to show up. And then they find out almost a day of the wedding that half of the people that were invited are not coming. Oh, my God. And who is going to bring resolve? Who's going to bring a cheerful atmosphere out of that? Because if nobody brings it, you better believe that's just got better try. So I'm trying to be upbeat with them. And I'm sitting there with now about 12 to 15 people out of a 40 to 50 people wedding. That's a dinner. And I'm saying to them, okay, listen. We're going to enjoy ourselves. We're not going to let that disturb you. We're not going to let that bother you because I want you to know God is still in the blessing business and marriage is still honorable in his sight. And I'm quoting all these scriptures while at the same time, you know what's going on in my mind. They out there with monkeys. Some crackhead is walking down the street and they get the boop, 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 boop. <laughs> So I'm sitting there and I do this wedding. And they do their vows with each other and they're having a good time with each other and everything. And then immediately after the wedding, I can't sit down and eat. I got to go out there with the locksmith and deal with that situation there. So I go out there with the locksmith. I'm left now to try to figure out 
how am I going to get some keys? We don't know. We've been looking all around the place. And now I'm being told, you know what? We don't know where the keys are. Anyone could have the keys. So this is what I decided to do. I said, you know what? I could sit around here and mope and cry and be woe as I and going through all these gyrations. But I said, no, you know what? I'm not going to let the devil steal my joy. It is easy to say I'm stingy with my joy and I'm going to hold on to my joy. It's easy to say that, but wait until you get put into that predicament. Some of you right now know that there are things in your life that even when you think about, it causes you to cringe. It causes you to feel hurt. It causes you to feel angered. It causes you to feel frustrated because you don't have answers. So what I did is I said to the person I was with, I said, you know what? Let's go out. We're going to go out. We didn't get a chance to eat here. We're going to go out. We're going to eat. We're going to have a good time. And I'm not going to worry about my keys. And then the next day, I'll just have to come over and get my car towed. And I'm going to get this, I'm going to get this uh, dealership to get my car towed. And then how, well, I'm going to find out in advance how much it's going to cost to get re, re my actual car. Call them up. And as Sister Jessica said, but she didn't tell you the price. They told me, oh, well, we can do that. It's just $1,000 for that. What? $1,000 to get your car rekeyed and get the sensors on it so that the new keys will pick it up. But you're going to have to bring your car into the dealership. Oh, my God. As they say in German, ought to lead. Oh, my God. So then I said, you know what? My life, Lord, is in your hands. And so that next morning, I got over there because my car is in a parking zone and it has big signs all around it. We will tow your car if it's left here at this day. So I'm thinking Sunday night, my car may be towed away or it may be stole away or it may be taken away. It may be vandalized. I don't know, but I'm having to trust God anyway. That next morning when we got to my car, I was like, thank God. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you. It wasn't vandalized. It wasn't broken into. All of these things were going on at the same time. And I'm saying, Lord God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. At the same time, I tell my friend, I said, hey, man, park right behind my car. We can go. And uh, like I said, I can get this information out of my, my glove compartment. And then, oh, by the way, how can I get that information? I had to leave the car back door on the right side open so I could get in there to get my documentation because had I locked the car without the keys, we don't have any way of getting in the car. So I said, oh, Lord. So I go, I'm in here trying to get these uh, documents out of it. And my friend, instead of parking behind my car, which is wide open, he decides to park across the street and down the street. And I'm saying, what is wrong with him? So I said, you know what? Let me get this documentation. Let me start getting in, try to call these people. They have my car towed. He gets out of his car, looks and sees this abandoned building. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not thinking in my mind to go to this abandoned building at all because abandoned buildings, that's where people get killed and <laughs> crushed. I'm not trying to go to the abandoned. He's walking over to the abandoned building to get my keys. And I'm like, man, please, you go, hey, the Lord use you. He goes over to the abandoned building and sees the windows have been broken out. And he decides, you know, wow, the windows are broken out. You know, sometimes it's good to have curious friends. They're just curious about things. And you'll be like, man, I want you to stay out of my business. But they're just curious all the time. This time he goes over here into this abandoned building with the windows broke out and he's looking in the abandoned building and he's looking down the window and he sees this little brown thing on the floor of the broken window and he reaches down in there and pulls out my keys and then he pushes the button boop, boop, boop. and I'm like what he says didn't I tell you that God knew where your keys are. And look here, I don't know about you all. You know, I when God moves in a way like that, I don't have no pretty face. Uh, hallelujah. I don't, I didn't say, praise the Lord. 
He works for those that praise him. Praise the Lord. I hollered out in the middle of my car, jumping up on the street. Hallelujah. Your Oprah didn't have nothing on me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't care who saw me, heard me, was around me, by me. I wanted them to know it was God and God alone that had worked that miracle. When God is working miracles, we need to be uh, put ourselves aside and be, begin to thank him for who he is and what he's doing in our life. Got to thank him. So I had my keys. I didn't have to pay the $1,000. I didn't have to pay the, all the other uh, extra uh, things that my other friend did, did pay some of the money to open up a car. But hey, listen, I'm just saying this here. God knows just what you need. If you'll join me in the book of 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, I'm almost through with the message. In 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, I'm going to begin at verse number one, and I want you to see this in the word of God, because when these things happen, there is a pattern that God wants us to take. There is a mentality that God wants us to make. There is a, 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 a mind a thought pattern that he really wants us to have. And this will help you out if you will take this in, because most of you all, I know you. I know what things you have to deal with a lot of times, but I want you to know if we'll take this attitude of gratitude, I want you to see what God will do. In the sixth chapter of 2 Kings, I'm going to begin reading at verse number one. I'll be reading a little bit expressively. It'll be the King James Version. But I want you to get this story down packed because God is getting ready to move for you also. Here we go. Uh, sixth chapter of 2 Kings, beginning at verse number one. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take there, take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants, and and uh, he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, wherein fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it thither. And did the iron, excuse me, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it unto thee. And he put out this hand and took it. In this, what I just read, because as I always mention, I know sometimes King James sounds a little uh, hard to understand. So I want you to understand what was taking place here. At this time, there was a prophet of God. His name is Elijah. Elijah is over a school of prophets. You know what, if you're ever gonna be anybody for Christ and God puts you into a leadership position, you should be one that will groom people to be able to take your place when you're not here. Don't think that Pastor Scott is not grooming uh, most of you uh, for ministry afterward by the things that I do, the things that I talk to you about, the things that you see in my life, it is always the point of trying to groom people so that whenever my time expires, then, hey, by all means, if I go out, then God has someone else to move in and take my place. So here's Elijah. He comes to visit one of his schools. And the Bible said that they were experiencing great growth. Don't you know that's a good thing? When people are growing in God and numbers are growing in God, I want you to know that shows that God is moving and that the people are being blessed by the word of God that they're being taught. Not everyone who goes to a church or to a temple or to a place that is of worship is being taught God's true unadulterated word. And if they're being taught, a lot of the teachers are not able to make the word so clear that it gives the people who are listening a clear concept of what to do in their own lives. Well, here in this story here, these people are 
desiring to grow. And as they're growing, they said, we've outgrown this actual school and we need more room, Elijah. Can we build a, a bigger school, uh, bigger than this one so we can hold more people? And Elijah says, yes. And they go down into a place called the Jordan. And if you notice, uh, the Jordan, all throughout the Bible, you hear about God doing great uh, and mighty exploits or miracles in the Jordan. So the people come down to the Jordan River and they start chopping this wood in order to build their school. And they're excited about it. And one of the students, he had borrowed an ax. And I want you to know, during those days, that ax was very, very expensive. And while he was chopping down this wood, he was standing near the Jordan River and he hit this actual wood and the ax head flew off of it and went into the river and he did not know where it went. And so all he knew is that it fell into this river and he began to panic and he said, Allah's Allah's master, master. And he was calling on Elijah and Elijah heard his call. I want you to know this because the reason why I have here get a handle on the anger and frustration that many of you have experienced loss. Many of you have experienced losing something that was very precious. It may have been a relationship. It may have been monies. It may have been friendship. It may have been things that you've had that you really want to have in your life and you've experienced that loss well, it's no different than you experiencing loss, that I experienced loss, and this same uh, individual in the Bible experiencing loss. And when you experience loss, especially something that was of no fault to yourself, you have to ask yourself, how does it make you feel? Minister Dion, how does it make you feel when you, when you lose something that you really, you really enjoyed and you lose it? How does it make you feel? Um, well, sir, it gives you a sense of like a void that you're trying to fill then. Mm -hmm. Sister Shade, how about you? Something, you ever had something that's precious to you and then you lost it? How did it make you feel when you lost it? It's upsetting, it's sad. You probably go through like a grieving process depending on what the situation was. Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, Minister Emmanuel, what about you? Have you ever had something that you thought was very, very dear and close to you and then you lost it? And God, how did it make you feel? made me feel very frustrated and just annoyed with myself yeah and as unique you said annoyed with yourself sister kate why do you think a person will get annoyed with their self when they lose something that's precious to them i guess when it's like an item of some sort that was very precious to you it's very annoying because you treasured it so much yeah very good very good sister tanya how do you deal with these frustrations, because that's one of the things, these frustrations of things not working out in your behalf. How, how do you deal with it? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, um, yeah, I, I, I think I have a tendency to blame myself for frustrations. I have a tendency, so to look at things differently than what I, how I used to look at things, you know, to first of all, go, in prayer and kind of see where my heart is at in those situations. Um, because I think we can tend to, you know, kind of like Emmanuel said, you know, you kind of blame yourself, you feel guilty, you feel like I should have done better, I should have, you know, paid more attention so I wouldn't lose this thing or whatever the case might be. Um, mm -hmm. So just kind of changing your mindset and how you're looking at it to, yeah. to grow from it instead of dwell on it. Absolutely, absolutely. That very mature answer. Um, Elder Angel Bear, how do you deal with these frustrations? You ever been frustrated on the, on the inside, inside and you had something and you couldn't share it with anyone? Yes, sir. How, how do you deal with stuff like that? My first response is usually to start crying. Mm. I cry a lot. And then, um, as my husband says, that's the way I process. Um, and I cry in prayer. I just go to God and I just tell him everything, how I'm feeling about it. If I'm mad, if I, if I feel betrayed, whatever the situation is, um, that's what I do. I, ch I cry a lot. And, and the enemy tries to make me feel like I'm stupid because I'm crying. 
-hmm. But I just be upset and that's how I express it. And the Lord comes in and he helps me with it. But my first response, I get very upset. I feel hurt and I'm, I'm crying. Absolutely. Uh, Elder, Elder Brian Barrett, how do you deal with your frustrations and your anger when you know it's like you want to react to a situation and you feel like that, that pain has been taken from you and it's like it takes a lot out of you? How does it make you feel? It makes you feel bad. Uh, like, for example, if you lost like your keys in your case, but in my case, I lost a hundred dollar bill somewhere. Mm. That, that's something you just never forget. And if mm -hmm. you never recover it, you're just thinking about it all the time. And then eventually over time, you kind of get to the point where, okay, I'm just not going to do that again. But between, by the time it happens to, I get to that point where I'm okay with it. There's a lot that goes on that process and God helps me mm -hmm. to continue to move on from there. Absolutely. 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 You know, you what? know what? I'm noticing that in my, even my own life, when I have loss or when I have to deal with something that seemingly is not going my way, I usually, the first thing that comes to my mind is I start looking at myself and wondering, what did I do wrong, God? That's what we do a lot of times. Lord, what did I do wrong? Because we equate a lot of times, good times, I must be doing what's right. Bad times, I must have done something wrong. But don't you know, sometimes there are things that just will pop up abruptly in our life and we have no control. This young man, all he's doing is chopping down these trees, trying to do a work for God. He's not trying to build his own house. He's not trying to build his own mansion. He's not trying to take care of other things for for himself? No. He's building an actual temple for God, and he's like, we want to have a new area, and everybody's going to uh, reach in here. So what he did is, he said, I don't have the tools to be able to get it accomplished, so I'm going to borrow this axe from this man. Now, think about this. Whoever he borrowed his axe from had to be someone that trust him to take care of it. I want to say it like this. This is going to be real talk. People don't give you things that are precious to them if they don't think you're trustworthy. No, they don't. The greatest gift anyone could ever and has ever given to mankind is the Holy Spirit. It is a gift of God. And God would not have given us the Holy Spirit, those of us who are saved, if he didn't think that you were going to try to take care of. There are certain places I do not go because I know I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. There are certain things I will not say because I know I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. There are certain things I will not consume in my body because I know I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. And I don't want to offend him. If it's somebody that you love and you care about, you should stay far away from whatever offends them. So this young man, he's actually chopping with this tree with this ax, and he knows this ax is expensive, so he's making sure that he's chopping it, and he's not thinking, he's not cognate, he's not aware that this, this ax that he has, even though the iron head is strong, but there's something wrong in the handle. The handle has a weakness in it. And the handle is that part that's supposed to hold the ax, the thing that's precious. And don't you know, we many times are just like that handle. We're supposed to be able to handle certain things and make sure that we give it over to God. And we make sure that we're, you know, we're keeping it close to us and we're having to tie it up. When it's something that's precious to you, okay, just so, just so I'm not talking to myself, okay, I got I to gotta get, get, get it real right now. Here we go, we'll get real. All right, uh, Sister Kate, so that's my friend. Sister Kate always keep it real. I just, K-I, real. Sister Kate, if you have something very precious to you, let's just say you have a million dollars, would you keep it? at home, in your purse, or in a bank? 
I would say probably in a bank. It seems a little bit more secure. Yeah. Why would you put it in a bank? I guess it just it's a lot more, like I said, it's more secure, more security there, and it's less likely to be taken mm -hmm. um, with it being here in my home. Yeah, very good. And Mr. Emanuel, what would you do if you got something that's pressured to you? Would you keep it at home? Uh, in your pocket, in your wallet, you had a million dollars, where would you put it? Yeah, like a safety deposit box. Mm -hmm. Why would you do something like that? Because I want it to remain safe and secure. You want it to remain safe and secure. If you say you have the Holy Spirit, and you say your peace is the most greatest commodity that you have, you need to make sure that it's someplace very secure. The Bible says it like this, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. If you're a person that's always getting offended by people, it's because you're not keeping your mind stayed upon him, which is God, because he says, if you keep your mind stayed upon him, which is God, he'll keep you in perfect peace. The problem with people is that we're trying to get the peace of the world. And the peace of the world needs the world to validate it. All right, let me try this. All right, Elder Angel Barrett, I need somebody to be able to break this thing down. The peace of the world needs something to validate it, to make it feel peaceful. What do you think I mean by it needs the world to feel peaceful about it? The uh, people in the world look for someone with the same mindset mm -hmm. to uh, validate them in whatever it is they believe. Mm -hmm. And even if it's wrong, they, they, that's where they get their peace from. If the world doesn't agree with them, mm -hmm. they're very upset and they fall apart. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. They get frustrated and angry. And, and Minister Dion, when people get angry, what do they want to do when people get angry? Um, well, sorry, when people get angry, some people, they might want to cuss you out mm -hmm. or just do some crazy stuff, might want to hit you, hurt you, some type of way to prove their point or defend themselves and why they think they're right. Right. Amen. And see, you came from out of that. So I know you know. You used to be one of them, matter of fact. Uh, let me go and talk about somebody who, like I said, I ain't never seen them mad. Uh, Elder Brian Barrett, uh, known him for 31 years, 30 one, one year. year. <laughs> I'll never forget I'll that. that. I've never I've seen him mad. Uh, Elder, Elder Brian Barrett, Barrett, how do, how do you, you hold that peace? What, what gives you that, that peace so that so when that you would, would get, get mad, mad and probably do violence, violence, you don't? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. But uh, just trusting in the Lord and then just don't allow people to get into that space where you have that you hold sacred and dear. Mm -hmm. You got to. If you don't, if you don't trust, trust in the Lord, Lord I'm, I'm telling you, you the enemy is always going to try to find some way to pull you out. And like I always say, whatever slows you down, eventually it will pull you down. And the worst part about it, everyone's going to see it. It is imperative to keep your peace. Because if you don't keep that peace, I want you to know the enemy's going to try to find some way. And this is how he always tries to steal the peace of the people of God. He has to get something that is dear to them and cause it to be disrupted, their lifestyle. Look at this young man. Now that he's been chopping that tree and that axe falls off into the Jordan River, he doesn't know where it is at. And he's crying out, I lost, I've lost it. I've lost this. And thank God that he goes to a man of God. Let me just say this uh, side note. I know uh, a lot of you uh, may not have been brought up in church or around church or around things that deal with God and everything. But I want you to know, when you have issues and problems, don't just rely on your own personal relationship with God. You should also go to those that know God better. 
Call your pastor up. Call those who are your, your leaders. Call them up. This young man, if you notice, he goes and he cries out to Elijah, Master, I've lost my axe. I lost that. And I borrowed it. Sometimes the very thing that we seem to have lost, it looks like the more that we look for it, it gets deeper and deeper, further and further away from us. When the actual axe first lost, from, well, uh, the handle broke off from the, the axe broke off from that handle. When it went into that water, there was a splash. You heard it. It riffled the waters, rippled the waters. And then as it gets deeper and deeper, <clears throat> you don't see any more rippling of the water. The same thing happens in our life. When certain things that we've lost in our past and things that we lost and we've given up on, we just say, you know what? I, I guess it isn't meant for me to have. I guess it isn't meant for me to work out. I guess it isn't uh, uh, meant for this thing to be a blessing to me in my life and other things. Sometimes we give up on God too fast. Just because we don't see that miracle right then and there, God is saying today, keep on believing. I didn't see those keys. I'd already fixated in my mind, my God, how am I going to come up with $1,000 and get new keys and get this core? How in the world am I going to do that? And while I'm trying to work on those type of things, I'm sitting here saying to myself, Lord, what, where? What do I do? How, do? how do I handle these situations? And God has somebody. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will speak to me about a situation afterward and tell me what he did. This is what he told me. I can only tell you what he told me. When those keys got lost, they were left on the street because the person that had the keys did not go in an abandoned building, did not walk through no broken glass, did not do any of that. But someone saw those keys on that street. And God said, Pick those keys up. Don't leave them on that street because any and everybody will find them right there because it's right there on the street, right there on the sidewalk. But put it in a place around that proximity where someone who's looking for it can find it. That is why that person took the keys off the street looked around and they saw they're standing right in front of this abandoned building, saw that the windows were broken out and decided to put it inside on this ledge area, inside this actual building's ledge where the windows are broken out. So the only person that could see it would be someone who's looking for it. God is saying, I'm getting ready to restore a lot of things that have been lost out of your life, but I need you to be looking for it. But the way you look for it is differently than the way it was lost. The Bible says it like this. First seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added. Your keys, your whatever that's lost, your relationships, your situation. The problem is, is that what happened is the people start looking for the thing more than they start looking for God. They start looking for the resource more than they start looking to the source. And God is saying, I want you to look to me. Elijah did not get on his knees and start looking in the water for the ax head. He didn't. He looked to the source. He looked to God. And I want you to know this. There's a saying, and it's a scripture that says, give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That, that's true. But God was not looking for him to use axe in order to put, I mean, use arm in order to track the axe head. What God did, he had him to cut down. Elijah went and cut a piece of the wood from another tree, just another piece. He didn't want to use what didn't work already. I wish you all listening to this. The handle that was used before wasn't strong enough and wasn't sturdy enough and wasn't built enough to help keep that axe on that actual handle. 
Some things God wants you to say, I want you to get a handle on it by giving it to God because you're not strong enough to handle the problems and the situations in your life. If I were to ask you right now, how many people have issues in their life right now that you cannot handle? You don't know how they're gonna work out. You don't know what to do. Every single one of us would have our hands up because we don't know. And God's trying to bring us to that place that when we don't know, then that's when we need to trust him because he does know. As the person told me on the very first day before the day that I found my keys, God knows where the keys are and God knows where the key to your heart is. And that thing that you said that you've not, you say you're not giving up on, but you're not looking for it to be answered. You're not looking for it to be worked out now. God is saying, don't use what you used before. I need you to get a new handle on it. Get a new handle on it. And God said, I will not put on you any more than you could bear. Elijah gets a new handle. And he does something totally unorthodox. You see, if, if it was just to get some iron, he would say, okay, put some iron in the water and that iron will attract iron. No, God wants to work a supernatural miracle like he did in my situation. He wants to work that in your life. And whatever that thing is that you've been looking for, God, some of you got brilliant business ideas. You haven't used them because in your mind, you feel like I don't have the right material. I don't have the right thing. But how in the world can wood attract iron? And God tells Elijah, chop that little piece of that tree off there. You now have a handle, put it in the water. And the Bible says that the ax head swam. Now, I don't know about you. Some of us, and I'm included, I'm not a good swimmer. And I've been around pools all my life. And I'm not a good swimmer. But there was no lesson that could be given to teach that ax how to swim because it went totally against all dimensions of, 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 of physics. How does an iron head axe, which weighs more than water, come rising to the water and swim itself to the shore so Elijah could pick it up? <laughs> All I'm trying to say in my conclusion for today, whatever that is that is ailing you and getting you frustrated and upset, I'm telling you now, give it to God. And how you give it to God is by saying, Lord, I can't handle it. I need you to get a handle on it. And if you'll bless that thing that I'm trying to get a handle on it with, it's going to work. And that, that very thing that you've been believing God for in times past, God says, I'm going to call it to swim all the way up to where you are so you can get that thing so that you'll be that success, so you'll have that relationship, so you'll have those finances, so you'll have everything that you need. But only thing, you got to seek God first. That's the whole secret. God wants his children to be prosperous. He wants you to be in good health above all things. He wants you to have everything that you desire. But first of all, he says, well, I got to make sure that you got me first. You got to have me. Because if you don't have me, all these things won't matter. And if you'll put yourself into God, like he put his self into us, we're going to see those blessings. And that's how we're going to get a handle on your anger and on your frustrations. When God moves, he takes away all frustration and anger immediately. I found out when God moved for me last week and got, got my keys back to me, I couldn't think about no, oh, I'm mad about this, I'm upset about this. No, I was so joyous and so uh, grateful. I said, Lord, I will, what, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Listen, when God moves for you, you should be trying to find out, Lord, I want to show you my appreciation and I want to do more to show my appreciation. So in my conclusion today, God wants us to realize it is not coincidental these things that have happened in your life. God is saying right now, I'm getting ready to, I'm getting ready to open these doors for blessing you, but I need you as I open a door 
Let me open the door while you open yourself to me. And as you're thinking and appreciating me for being God, I'm going to show you my love by bringing into your life that very thing that you thought had been lost. Amen. Without any further ado, I'm going to stop there at that point there. I want you all to know I so much appreciate and thank God for each and every one of you that have come on with me today. I appreciate, just like I said, seeing your lovely faces. Those who are on camera, got my, my dear friend, great missionary Maxine Howe. That's my friend. That's it. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. Sister Kate uh, Trussell, good to, uh, I can't see you, but thank you for coming out. Sister Lorelai, Dominique, so good to always see you on. Sister Jaden. Emily Stock, good to see you. Uh, Sister Amanda, Sister Beverly, Sister Shalita, oh, everybody who got a chance to uh, come on with us today. Thank you all so very much because we all make the work of God easier for each other. Minister Chiari, I thank you so much, sir. And uh, I love each and every one of you all. Let's end with a word of prayer today. And uh, Mr. Chiari, can you say the ending prayer? Yes, sir. It'd be my all pleasure. Right. Let's do this. Awesome. Um, maybe by our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful word on today, Father. Um, Lord, as always, you come through for us. You come through for us through our gifts, Lord God, letting us know that, Lord God, we are honored, we are, we are loved, we are, we are just so appreciative, Lord God, of everything that you give us, Lord. We know that as we continue to chase after you, Father God, you will truly stand in. Even in those times where we don't understand what's going on, Father, you are still there to be a resource for us, Father, and we thank you so, so much. Lord God, we understand that as we do your work, as we work for you, Lord God, you will stand in, you will give us resources, and ultimately, Father God, you will give us reward. We understand that by being believers in your son, Lord God, and honoring you, that you have a true treasure for us in heaven, and we thank you for that. As we continue to meet every Sunday for Bible, Lord God, may we not just learn the word, but may we ingest it, may we replicate it, and may we live it, Father. It's in your great, great name, Lord God. We thank you so much for this time. Thank you for this preaching, this teaching that's built on integrity and word, Father God. And may you continue to allow Pastor Scott to guide this ministry in the way that you need. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you all again. Love you all. We'll see you next Sunday. We're going to have a dynamic word next Sunday. Do come out. And uh, again, I appreciate each and every one of you all. Invite a friend, invite two friends. And we want to just pack all these screens all out so they'll have people just all the way. You have to be looking on two or three screens over to find out where my friend at. So we appreciate and love you all. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.